Hey guys, Max here, and this is your daily update for the 7th of December yesterday. Today we're going to cover the worldwide markets, touch on tech, crypto and oil in particular. Have a quick look at China's monetary policy changes before finishing off with some lighter business topics. So worldwide markets extended their rally that we saw the day before with pretty much everywhere going up at least a bit. The US did quite well, rising a couple percent with tech and the Nasdaq doing particularly well. The Nasdaq was up 3% on the day, which was its best one day performance for months, I think since March in 2021, so about eight months there, pretty good performance. It is worth noting that tech is still down on the year though, by and large the Nasdaq as well, these companies have still taken a beating. Oil is up a little bit again, continuing this trend now sitting just above $70 a barrel. It looks like at least to me that oil is returning back to its natural level sitting at around $80 a barrel, we'll probably see it reach that target within a couple weeks. Crypto, again, following this trend, is up a few percent. Bitcoin is holding just above $50,000, Ethereum's holding just above $4,000, and there's a similar story being told across all the altcoins. In general, they're holding their previous points, finding levels of support, and there's no real major shifts. It seems on the surface that Omicron fears have continued to subside as new news and data has been coming out surrounding the variant and it doesn't look too bad. It also seems like the hawkish Fed changes have either been forgotten or just ignored. In general, markets are up because people are bullish about demand. They're no longer predicting lockdowns based on this Omicron variant and that's good for markets as a whole. There have been lots of retail buyers of the dip and there's been some institutional support as well, though it is mostly driven by the retail crowd at this point. What I think is really going on is that firstly, yes, Omicron fears were much higher than they needed to be and the market is finally starting to realise that the variant isn't actually that much of a threat so prices are rising as a result of that. The other big negative news from last week was that the Fed changed its stance to a more hawkish one with Jerome Powell coming out and saying that tapering could get harder and stronger and interest rate rises might come sooner than expected. Now I think the market is pricing in the possibility that this Fed's hawkish stance is not going to come to fruition. Either that the Fed is just talking big that it won't actually change this hawkish stance or that circumstances will change in the future and they won't have to be hawkish and they can go back to the big old Jerome Powell we know as a dovish man. Basically, people are betting that loose monetary policy is going to last longer than expected or longer than they expected a week ago, but still probably shorter than they expected a month ago. It is totally unclear at this point how long this rally will last, but if tapering does accelerate, that will likely stop the rally. If tapering doesn't stop the rally, then interest rates rising almost certainly will. It will damage valuations, especially on the NASDAQ with those tech high growth companies as we've already discussed. Now over in the East, China is starting to worry about its weakening economy. In short, demand for pretty much everything is slowing, consumption amongst its citizens is dropping, and home prices are falling. All in all, there's a lot of bad news coming out of China right now and not much good news. So the CCP has reacted to this and they've done so by loosening their monetary policy. In particular, they've changed the bank reserve requirements for lending, basically meaning that fractional reserve banking is going to get stronger. And this is going to encourage lending and spending in the economy, hopefully to stimulate the economy and stop it from entering a recessionary period. Chinese developers are still doing very badly. They are continuing to drop and there are still a bunch of them on the brink of bankruptcy just waiting to actually topple over. China's tech crackdown, of course, has only made the economy worse, so some people are predicting that the CCP will change their ways and that they will no longer target big tech companies as the economy is taking a hit already. Maybe this is a wake-up call for the CCP, maybe this is them realising that capitalism has to be respected or wealth will disappear, and maybe these regulatory crackdowns stop popping up as a result of that. Now, in my opinion, I don't think that's the case. I think that it's possible that these regulatory crackdowns, these targeting of high growth, very powerful companies stop popping up for one or two years maybe, but the CCP cares about preserving its status and its power more than it cares about the wealth of the country. In terms of some of the details from China, well, Evergrande in particular is trying to restructure its debt as dollar bond holders have not been getting paid at all. S&P Global Ratings came out and said that an Evergrande collapse is literally inevitable, it will happen, it's just a matter of time, and that's no surprise on this channel as we've been saying this for months now. But what are the chances of this restructuring of the debt actually working? Well, that's going to depend on the support from the CCP. 
it does now seem clear that the Communist Party is not trying to save Evergrande at all. They're not trying to preserve the company, but they are trying to reduce fallout and contagion. And to be honest, that's fair enough. That isn't really a policy decision that I can criticize as it all makes perfect sense. However, it seems to be a little bit too little too late. There are already more than 10 Chinese billion dollar companies defaulting on their debt and contagion is already there. In my mind, it's game over. It's started. This collapse is already on its way. Now, in a little bit of geopolitical news, the US and Russia tensions over Ukraine have been getting worse, as I'm sure you've seen. I'm going to try and not get into the details because this is a finance channel, but a war or a border conflict between Russia and the US could be a catalyst for a market crash. It could also definitely be something to blame for pre-existing economic problems, and so that is something to watch out for. In terms of this sort of impact on Russia itself, well, the country could be cut off from SWIFT, which is basically a worldwide banking system, which would be very, very bad for the Russian economy and particularly Russian stocks. On top of that, high tensions could disrupt the production and the finishing of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which would reduce supply of natural gas in Europe in the future and could cause more energy price hikes like we've seen over the last couple months, which is bad for Europeans. Russia, though, have been preparing for this sort of Cold War. They've been stocking up on gold with their central bank. They've been getting rid of US dollars and they've called it de-dollarization. This has been happening for months, though, and the only real development with this is that India and Russia have agreed to not use dollars anymore when they're making deals, and this is a big loss for the US. Really, the current US administration is neglecting soft power with future very important powers like India, and it's really bad news. Again, I'm trying not to get into too much of the politics of it, but this is really short-sighted and it's only going to be bad news for US soft power in the future, especially as India continues to grow and get wealthier and more powerful as well. Now to a couple bit of less serious pieces of news. Elon Musk did an interview and he spoke out against the US infrastructure bill, calling it too expensive and unnecessary. He also spoke out about government interference with capital and why it's bad. And he spoke out against oil and gas subsidies. Now, he got a fair amount of criticism from this, at least from what I've seen. People claiming that he's just pushing his agenda, that these ideas that he's pushing forward would help him get rich and help his company succeed. And yes, that is true. If everything that he talks about becomes law, he would do well. But that doesn't mean that what he's talking about is wrong. I think he's getting far too much criticism for just stating his opinion, especially when his opinions are backed up by fact. I have to say, though, his haircut is absolutely atrocious. I have no idea who did it, but that person needs to be fired. Again, in a little bit funny news, there is a meme stock ETF launching, hoping to land future giant pumps like we saw with GameStop or AMC earlier in the year. Obviously, this ETF is going to be very high risk and very volatile and give you the potential of getting some very high returns, and it will be fun to watch. But I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that I won't be buying it. To be perfectly honest, it's probably too late and we're near the end of the bull run. This ETF really should have come out at least six months ago, maybe even nine months ago, if they wanted to make some serious money out of it. In stupid business decisions moves, Better.com, an online real estate startup type thing like Zillow, like Open Door, laid off 900 employees via one Zoom call and it was the stupidest decision I've seen a company make all year. The company was hoping to go public via SPAC, they've been backed by SoftBank, but apparently they don't have an HR department. This really encapsulates the stupidity that some tech companies have where they think that everything needs changing, everything needs innovating, and they look at something like an HR department and they think it's useless. But at times like this, an HR department is really important. And it's so stupid that a company of this size that's about to fire 900 people thought they'd do it over a singular Zoom call. Like, of course, someone's going to record it and put it online and you're going to come off looking awful. How they made that decision, I have no idea. Finally, I'm going to link down below an interesting article on Bloomberg about crypto YouTube and that niche. Uh, the link will be down in the description, as I just said, for anyone. But it will also be on my Patreon if you're stuck behind a paywall. Basically, it just talks about the growth of this new media niche, the problems that we see with scams in the comments. I'm sure you've no doubt seen them in my comment section. They are absolutely rife and it's just impossible to get rid of them. But the article is very interesting. It's interesting to see Bloomberg pick up on new media like Brian Young. That's the guy who most of the article is about. And it's very relevant to my channel as well because we're in a very similar niche. So I thought you guys might enjoy it. That's pretty much it for today. If you enjoyed this video, then leave a like and a comment to bless the YouTube algorithm. If you want more content like this, then check out our Patreon and join our community of investors. You get access to our Discord, loads of exclusive content like private live streams, extra videos and buy and sell alerts for my own personal portfolio. 
There's a link in the description to masterworks.io, a site that allows you to buy fractional shares of art from world famous artists like Banksy, which can be a great way to diversify your portfolio with non-market correlated assets. There's also a link in the description to BlockFi, which will give you up to $250 in free Bitcoin when you use it. You can also get 9% interest on stable coins like USDC, which is a far higher rate than you'll get from any savings account these days. Just make sure not to use Tether. Thank you all for the support. Thanks for watching. Stay stoic. Until next time.